Welcome to lesson 4.9, which is on design of bituminous mixtures. We will be covering this topic in two parts. This lesson will be on part 1 of design of bituminous mixtures. This is a series of lessons that we are covering under payment design module, which is module 4. In the previous lessons, we have covered a few lessons on payment materials starting with subgrade soils, granular materials and bituminous binders, different types of bituminous binders, bitumen, tar, emulsion, cutback and modified binders. Though the properties that we are going to discuss in this lesson and the subsequent lesson are not directly correlated to any inputs that we use in payment design you recollect that this is a module on payment design, but it is generally seen that many of the payments which have been constructed recently have been failing mostly not because of any problem with payment design, but many of these problems have been associated with the failures that have been occurring in bituminous mixtures themselves. So, that is why I thought it fit to cover some aspects of bituminous mix design, because this is an essential aspect and in fact, this has become a very difficult art in the recent past. This is because of lack of, lack of experience that we have in India about how these mixes are going to perform, because uh, we have not observed the performance of thick bituminous layers for quite some time. And as a result, what are the exact specifications to be adopted? for designing these mixes is still uh, is not so well known in India. So, uh, as it is the main objective of this lesson is to make the student appreciate the requirement of different types of bituminous mixes, mix that is used in surface, mix that is used as a binder course, which is subjected to different types of loading conditions, different stresses. So, as it is the requirement of different types of bituminous mixes will be different. We will try to understand those requirements. It is also expected that the student will be able to understand the effect of various mix parameters on the performance of bituminous payments. Basically, mix design is nothing but finding out in which proportion different components of bituminous mixes should be mixed and then adopted. So, in adopting different proportions, we are going to have different mix parameters, either in volumetrics or other structural pra strength parameters, which of these parameters has got or, or rather have got better correlation with the performance of the payments. We will try to understand that also. It is also expected that the student will learn about different aggregate gradations and also if is supplied with different aggregate sources, how to blend them and then obtain a desired gradation. This is just the part 1 of mix design process. In the next part, we will be covering how exactly the mixes are to be prepared, tested and how optimum combinations of different components of mixes are to be obtained. What you see here is a typical bituminous pavement. In fact, this is a section of National Highway 6, especially bituminous mixes that are used for high volume roads are subjected to various conditions such as number of repetitions of loads, 
heavy loads, often we see lot of overloading that is occurring in India and various climatic conditions including various temperatures, low temperatures, high temperatures and also these are subjected to various moisture conditions. So, the mixtures that we are going to use either in surfacing or in the binder course have to sustain various loading conditions and the climatic conditions. Accordingly, different mixtures will have to be for uh, adopting different specifications in terms of volumetric proportions, in terms of other mechanical properties. Bituminous payment fail in different ways. They fail by cracking because this is a bound layer, bound material. So, it is likely to crack. Cracks can be initiated from the bottom, especially caused by flexure. As the layers get flexed, there are tensile stresses developed at the bottom, leading to development of initiation of crack at the bottom, which gradually progresses to the top. These are what are known as bottom up cracks. Usually, these are caused by repeated application of loads or repeated application of thermal cycles or other environmental cycles. So, the cracking can be initiated mostly from the bottom, but we can also have cracks that initiate from top and progress downwards as can be seen in the core of bituminous pavement that has been taken out. You can see the crack that is initiated from the top and progressing to the bottom. These are what are known as top down cracks caused by various reasons and various conditions. These also need to be taken into consideration while designing the mixes, but a more serious problem that is being encountered in India is rutting. rutting as we have discussed in the initial lessons of this series is caused by permanent deformation in different pavement layers. It can be in the subgrade layer, it can be in granular bases or it can be in bituminous layer also. All these layers or some of these layers can undergo permanent deformation which gets reflected in the surface in the form of rut depth. Many of the recently constructed pavements having thick bituminous layers have shown this problem. On investigation, it was revealed that the problem was mainly confined to the thick bituminous layers that were used. So, this is a problem that is related to especially the mixes, especially that, that, that is what has been observed in the recent past, especially in thick pavements. So, this is not so much of a problem that is arising out of either subgrade, subbase or base. Of course, in a given situation, permanent deformation can occur in subgrade, subbase, base and in bituminous layer also. So, what would you see at top will be an accumulation of all the permanent deformation that is occurring in different layers. But what we are concerned in designing mixes is to see that the mixes in a given condition do not undergo excessive permanent deformation. We cannot design mixes uh, which do not undergo any permanent information at all during its service life period, but that should not be excessive. Another failure that is more or less related to rutting or caused because of uh, similar reasons is bleeding, which is the occurrence of presence of excessive bitumen film at the surface. Though it is not a major structural failure, but this reduces the skid resistance of the pavement surface and also it does not give a good impression of the pavement that is constructed. As we have seen in the previous slides, there are various types of failures, fatigue cracking, cracking that is caused by repetitions of load or thermal stresses, top down cracking low temperature cracking. Cracking can also be because of very low temperatures mix trying to shrink and the restraint that is provided to the mix from being shrunk is a resultant of can cause low temperature cracking. Usually, these are in the transverse direction occur at different spacing. 
but normally these are confined to areas where there is very low temperature uh, especially in winter. We also talked about rutting failure and bleeding failure. There can of course be various other types of failures which get initiated once fatigue cracking takes place or other types of cracks take place and once rut forms there is accumulation of water, there is infiltration of water through these cracks and then which start damaging the bituminous pavement. There are of course different types of bituminous mixes that we use. Some of these layers are thin, some of them are thick and have different gradation of aggregates, different characteristics used for specific purposes. Some of these are premix carpet, surface dressing, mix surfacing, these are thin bituminous surfacing courses, usually of the order of 20-25 millimeter thickness and having various characteristics in, in terms of the voids that it has got and also in terms of the stability it has got. Then we have bituminous macadam, dense bituminous macadam, semi dense bituminous concrete. Bituminous macadam and dense bituminous macadam are usually adopted for binder course, what are known as binder courses. For example, if bituminous layer is constructed in a thick layer, the main structural layer will be binder course, whereas the surface will have 25 to 40 millimeter or 50 millimeter thick layer. So, this is the one that is exposed to the surface, below that there will be thicker binder course. Obviously, the requirement of a surface course and the requirement of a binder course will be different And we have bituminous concrete and semi dense bituminous concrete SDBC, BC used as surfacing courses. And we also have a new type of relatively new in India mix that is used as stone mix asphalt, where usually the gradation is of coarser size, especially used when there is an excessive problem of rutting. As I indicated, these are thin surfaces, there are also thick surfaces, we would consider some of those surfaces wh whose thickness would be 20 millimeters, 25 millimeters to be thin and surfaces having 40, 50 millimeter thickness as thicker surfaces. We can have thick binder courses and the mixes can be cold mixes as well as hot mixes. Cold mixes are those mixes in which we generally use emulsions where there is no requ requirement of heat. So, those are called as cold mixes, but our discussion will be confined or the design of mixes that we will be discussing about will be about hot mixes. So, the term that we normally use is HMA hot mix asphalt. So, we will be discussing about hot mixes. These mixes are subjected to different traffic loading conditions, different temperatures and different moisture conditions. Basically, on different in, a, in different project sites, you can expect different loading conditions, different traffic intensities and different climatic conditions. The objective of hot mix design is to develop an economical blend of aggregates and asphalt which we are otherwise calling as bitumen that meets design requirements. For a given specific project, there are specific requirements. So, we have to find an economical blend that blend of aggregates and binder. What are the requirements of bituminous mixes? Bituminous mixes should be designed to withstand heavy traffic loads under adverse climatic conditions and to provide adequate structural and functional character to the pavement. Although I indicated this to be heavy traffic and adverse climatic conditions, what I really meant was that they should perform under varying conditions. Obviously, we are not going to design same type of mixes 
for all climatic conditions depending on the climatic conditions that is specific to a specific project and also the traffic loading that is expected and the number of load repetition that are expected at a given location we are going to have a specific mix design for that particular site and it should have adequate structural strength and it should also have adequate functional character what we mean by functional character is when it is used mostly used as a surface layer it should provide adequate functional performance that means the riding surface that is going to be provided should also be satisfactory continuing with the specific requirements of bituminous mixes it should have sufficient stability that means it should have sufficient resistance against flow it should have sufficient durability because the mixes have to serve for a period of 10 years 15 years without failing so that's a time dependent service that we are expecting so during this time period they should also be durable when they are subjected to various climatic conditions they should be sufficiently impermeable depending upon where we are using this material if it is surface it also should provide an impermeable surface so that water does not go into the layers and then da cause damage to different pavement layer the mix that we design should be sufficiently workable with the equipment that we normally use and it should have adequate flexibility it should not be too rigid so that if uh, when load is applied it's not able to deflect as a result it, it is going to induce cracks so there should be adequate flexibility that should be provided it should have sufficient fatigue resistance it is a resistance to withstand repeated application of loads or repeated application of cyclic variations of temperature stresses and it should also provide sufficient skid resistance this is one of the important surface characteristics that we try to attain while designing the bituminous mixes in order to fulfill all those criteria what is required is the mix should have sufficient binder to ensure a durable pavement the binder should be sufficient to coat thoroughly the aggregate particles and it should be sufficient to waterproof we know bitumen has got the waterproofing uh, quality and it should be sufficient to provide waterproofing property and bind the aggregates together under suitable compaction whatever is the compaction effort that is selected under that compaction effort the bitumen should be sufficient so as to coat all the particles and then bind them together and the mixes should have sufficient stability for providing resistance to deformation under sustained loads depending on the project site it may be load that is applied for longer periods or load that is applied for shorter periods but repeatedly so under both conditions it should have sufficient resistance to deformation under sustained loads and repeated loads this resistance in the mixture is obtained from mostly aggregate interlocking and cohesion within the bitumen which generally develops due to binder in the mix the mix has got cohesion because of the binder that is available there but the aggregate interlocking that can be mobilized is of more importance when we talk about stability as we said earlier it should have sufficient flexibility also to withstand deflection and bending without cracking to obtain desired flexibility it is necessary to have proper amount and grade of bitumen if you use too stiff a bitumen too small a binder content the mixes are usually going to be stiff will not be flexible then they are more likely to crack they should also have sufficient voids in the total compacted mix sufficient to provide space for additional compaction that is expected to take place during the service life period because subsequently traffic loads are going to be applied they are going to cause further compaction known as secondary compaction so there should be enough space to provide for the additional compaction that is anyway going to take place because of secondary compaction and also the mixer should have sufficient workability for an efficient construction operation in laying the paving mix and the finished surface should have adequate skid resistance for example a blending surface which is rich in bitumen too much of binder is provided this will result in reduction in skid resistance 
Bituminous mix usually is designed in terms of its volumetrics. Why we design in terms of volumetrics? We will discuss a little later. Bitumen has bituminous binder. It has got aggregates of different sizes, coarse, fine and filler. The aggregates are identified in terms of the maximum size of aggregate, uh, which uh, in turn can be represented in terms of maximum aggregate size or nominal maximum aggregate size. To convert a given quantity of bitumen, say 100 grams of bituminous mix into volumes of the corresponding constituents, that is volume of aggregate, volume of binder and obviously, there is also, also going to be some air void content. So, to calculate those air void con, uh, uh, contents, we need to have the specific gravity of all these components. If you know the weights and also if you know the specific gravities, we can of course, calculate the volume of each component and then express in terms of percentages. Bituminous mix typically can be represented like this. It is a matrix of aggregates, coarse, fine and filler and bitumen and there would be some air voids also in between. So, this typically is a bituminous mix and this consists of mostly aggregates and the aggregates can be in three different conditions. It can be dry, it can be surface dry, surface dry being the surface pores are filled with water as you see here, but there is no water on the surface of the aggregate which has been dried. This is what is known as a surface dry condition of aggregate and this is an aggregate which has been coated with bituminous film on the surface and a part of bitumen has penetrated into the surface pore not fully whatever uh, uh, volume that could be filled by water normally cannot be filled by bitumen because of the higher viscosity. So, this is a coated aggregate. So, you have the volume of aggregate, you have the volume of binder that is coating and part of the binder has gone into the pores. This is what we have to consider when we examine the volumetrics of bituminous mix. The same thing is represented in this sketch. At the center you have the volume of aggregate and this one here is the water permeable pores, but which cannot be perme permeated by bitumen and the yellow portion is that part of the surface pore of the aggregate which is permeable to bitumen. And the outer ring represents the coated film of bitumen and in between these aggregates we have air void. So, you have a number of aggregate particles which have been coated with bituminous binder in between you have air voids. This is again represented in this schematic arrangement you have volume of mineral aggregate. Part of this has been filled with bitumen, assuming that there are surface voids which can be filled by bitumen. This is the total asphalt that we are using, part of that is going into the aggregates because of the surface pores that are available and there is also some air void content between the coated aggregates particles. So, we are using various terms to represent the volumetrics. V A is the volume of air void, V B is the volume of binder, V M B is the bulk volume including air void, binder content and the total volume of aggregates and so on. We will discuss about these terms in the next slide. various terms that we are using rather uh, that we have used in the previous slide are VMA, this is the volume of voids in the mineral aggregate, 
V m B, this is the bulk volume of the compacted mix. Obviously, we are going to use aggregates, we are going to use binder, put them together, heat them and then compact them using certain compaction effort. So, what you finally get is a compacted mix, within that mix there are going to be some air voids. So, we are referring to the volume matrix of the compacted mix. So, this will have there will be some voids within the mineral aggregates that were provided, part of that voids within the mineral aggregate if you consider only the aggregate skeleton structure that voids that we are going to have in the mineral aggregate is going to be filled partly with bitumen, the remaining is going to be air void content. So, V m A is the volume of voids in the mineral aggregate, V m B is the total bulk volume rather bulk volume of the compacted mix, V m M is the voidless volume of paving mix. If you do not consider the volume of air voids, what you get is the voidless volume of paving mix. If you compare V m M with V m B, you get an idea of what is the air void content. V f A is the volume of voids in mineral aggregates filled with asphalt, V A is the volume of air voids, V B is the volume of asphalt or binder, V B A is the volume of absorbed asphalt, V S B is the volume of mineral aggregates calculated using the bulk specific gravity of the aggregates, V S E is the volume of mineral aggregates calculated using the effective specific gravity of the aggregates. Let us consider two different cases and see how the volume matrix different. Case 1 is we are considering aggregates that are non absorptive, there are no surface pores. So, neither water or nor bitumen can penetrate into the surface pores, let us consider that case. Let us consider the bulk volume of the compacted mix is let us say 100 cc represented by V m B. Let us consider the volume of mineral aggregates that, that has been used in the mix, we know what is the weight of aggregate that we have used in the mix and we know the bulk specific gravity of the aggregates. So, we know the bulk volume of aggregates that has been used in the compacted mix. So, let us say that is about 86 cc and let us also consider the volume of asphalt that we put is 10 cc. Again we know the weight of binder that is used, we, we can also find out what is the specific gravity of the binder, then we can calculate what is the volume of binder that we have used in 100 cc uh, compacted specimen. Then V B A is the volume of absorbed asphalt or absorbed bitumen, which since we are considered non absorptive aggregates. So, obviously, no bitumen is absorbed, we are considering this to be 0. V S C volume of mineral aggregates assessed in terms of effective specific gravity, which is equal to V S B, because there is no absorption here. So, there is no difference between effective specific gravity and bulk specific gravity. So, we get 86 cc for effective volume, volume of mineral aggregates, both by effective specific gravity calculation and also by bulk specific gravity calculation. So, the volume of air voids will be 100 cc is the total volume or bulk volume of the mix compacted mix, out of that 86 cc is the volume of aggregates, 10 cc is the volume of binder, obviously the remaining is 4 cc. We have put 10 cc of bitumen in the mix, Nothing, none of this material has gone into the aggregates. So, the air void content here is 10 minus 86 minus 100 minus 86 minus 10 that is 4 cc. If we express this in terms of percentages, this will be 4 percent air void content. Similarly, V m A volume of voids and mineral aggregates is 100 minus volume of aggregates that is 14 cc, voidless volume of paving mix will be 86 plus 10 that is aggregate plus bitumen. 96 cc, V f A volume of voids filled with asphalt is 10 cc, okay. which is 10 cc. So, this is normally expressed as a percentage of the total voids and mineral aggregate, which was 14, uh, 14 cc or 14 percent. 
So, 10 by 14 into 100. So, this is the percentage of volume of voids filled with asphalt. Let us consider another case where the aggregates can absorb some amount of bitumen. So, let us consider again Vmb to be 100 cc, Vsb to be 86 cc, we have put the same quantity of aggregate. Calculating this volume, we know the mass of aggregate that is taken, calculating this volume by bulk specific gravity, we get the bulk volume that is 86 cc, volume of asphalt or bitumen let us say again 10 cc, volume of asphalt absorbed is let us assume out of the 10 cc that we have provided, let us assume 2 cc gets absorbed in the aggregates. So, the volume of mineral aggregates calculated by effective specific gravity will be 86 minus 2 that is 84 cc. Volume of air voids will be now 100 minus 86 minus 8 because 2, uh, 2 cc of bitumen has gone into the aggregates. So, volume of air void is 6 cc here expressed in terms of percentage it will be 6 percent air void here. VMA is volume of voids in mineral aggregate. So, it will be 100 minus 86 14, voidless volume of paving mix will be 86 plus 8 that is 94 cc, volume of voids filled with asphalt will be 8 cc that is 10 minus 2. So, expressed as percentage this will be 8 by 14 into 100 that will be 57.14. To calculate all these volumetrics, the parameters that we need to measure will be specific gravity of binder, bulk specific gravity of mineral aggregate, bulk specific gravity of compacted mix, specific gravity of voidless volume of paving mix that is GMM. Using this information, we can calculate effective specific gravity of mineral aggregate, volume of voids in mineral aggregate volume of voids filled with asphalt, volume of air voids, volume of asphalt, volume of absorbed asphalt. We have discussed about bulk specific gravity of aggregates uh, in the lesson on aggregates, but let us consider that again. Bulk specific gravity is a dry mass of a specimen divided by the volume of water replaced by the saturated surface dry aggregate. Whereas, the bulk specific gravity of the compacted mix can be obtained by getting the dry mass of the mix compacted mix divided by the volume of water replaced by the saturated surface dry specimen. We have to first have the specimen saturated surface dry then take its weight in air and weight in uh, water then see what is the volume replaced that is the bulk volume. So, dry mass divided by this bulk volume that we get gives you bulk specific gravity of compacted mix. We can also get the specific gravity of voidless volume of paving mix which is JMM also called as maximum theoretical specific gravity of the mix uh, by uh, preparing loose mix which is not compacted and then finding the dry mass of the loose mix and then finding the volume of water replaced by the saturated surface dry loose mix. What you see here is a photograph of the arrangement that we normally use to measure the specific gravities of mixes and aggregates. As I indicated here, I mentioned that we will discuss about the significance of volumetric parameters and their correlation to the performance. Air void content is the most important volumetric parameter that is considered having great significance or great influence on the performance of the payments. There were several studies conducted in different countries, especially in hot climatic conditions, especially uh, such as India. These indicate that the mixes having air void content, whose air void content gets reduced to about 2 to 3 percent after serving some uh, years of traffic, say 2 years, 3 years, 5 years, 10 years. If the air void content gets reduced to 2, 3 or even lesser, these are mixes that are likely to fail by rutting or bleeding. If you construct a pavement using a certain mix, after some time if you take core and find out what is the air void content in the mix, if the air void content is found to be less than 2 percent or 3 percent, 
these are mixes that are more likely to fail by rutting and then bleeding. What you see here is a, a typical it's a trend of how airwards vary with time. Obviously, initially airwards are going to be let us say 6 percent, 7 percent whatever it is airward content that you initially designed with and then with traffic that is with secondary compaction airward content is going to get reduced. But for the mixes to perform satisfactorily this airward content should not get reduced to less than 2 or 3 percent. That is what is meaning of this. If you have sufficient airward content if you consider the aggregate to aggregate interaction can be represented by a spring and then which, which uh, spring which is put in a bituminous medium there is sufficient airward content in this uh, diagram that I have shown on the left side when load is applied it is a spring that takes the main load only when it gets so much compacted or so much deformed then only the vitamin comes into play that is when you have sufficient airward content. But on the right hand side there are no airwards the complete medium is filled with bitumen as soon as you apply load the bitumen starts taking load bitumen by itself will not be having sufficient strength to carry loads. So, as a result it starts flowing this is just to illustrate the importance of having adequate airward content. If you have a very low airward content in the bituminous mix the load transmitted by the mix is through bitumen and not by aggregates. So, mix loses its strength when bitumen is almost in a continuous phase. This leads to bleeding because of the secondary compaction and also when bitumen expands because of increase in temperature. But on the other hand if you try to have more airward content those more uh, larger airward content allows free circulation of air within those airwards. This causes oxidation of the bitumen and the bitumen becomes stiffer it loses its flexibility and it is more likely to crack. Also it permits free circulation of water within those pores and water as you know can damage bituminous layers and uh, it can cause stripping and then raveling. Ministry of Shipping and Road Transport Highways recommends 3 to 6 percent airward content for bituminous concrete mixes and DBM mixes. But most agencies design mixes to have an airward content of 4 percent after years of traffic. What we have to remember is we are targeting at an airward content which would be obtained after years of traffic. So, the primary objective of mixed design is to select aggregate gradation, proper aggregate skeleton and the corresponding binder content which when compacted this mix when compacted by a standard compaction effort should yield an air wide content of 4 percent. This is what most agencies try to do they try to prepare a mix which when compacted by a standard compaction effort will yield an air wide content of 4 percent this standard compaction effort normally should result, should be simulating the secondary compaction initial compaction that is attained after years of traffic. So, this is the compaction that is expected to be there after years of compaction years of traffic. The compaction effort as I just indicated should correspond to that attained in the field after years of traffic. The mix also has to satisfy obviously other volumetric and strength consideration because what air voids is not only the consideration there will be other considerations to take care of other problems. So, next task that are the most important task that is to be done is you have to select an aggregate skeleton structure then you have to select an appropriate binder content to be used optimum binder content. What happens when you go on increasing for a given aggregate gradation structure you go on increasing the bitumen content obviously the air void content is going to go on getting decreased. And when you go on increasing the bitumen content the stability increases up to certain point 
then it starts decreasing. Initially, as you go on increasing the binder content, it would lubricate all the particles and enable the particles to get into denser positions. So, as a result, it attains greater strength. But after a certain point, the additional bitumen that we add does not add to additional compaction effort or uh, uh, attaining better density. It will only be increasing the thickness of the film, then it would not add to any additional strength. But if you go on increasing the bitumen content, it is going to be more durable because you are going, going to put more bitumen, film thickness is going to be more. So, in the long run, the aging is going to be reduced, it is going to be more durable thing. So, it is a fine balance of getting an appropriate binder content which will give durable mixes, which will also give appropriate air wide content, which will give strong stable mixes. So, you have to some of these are contradictory. If you increase bitumen content, durability will increase. If you increase bitumen content, air wide will decrease and with increasing bitumen contents, stability will increase and after some point, stability will decrease. So, bitumen content will have to be carefully be selected. Let us consider the effect of aggregate size and gradation on mix properties. The size of aggregate and gradation affect the workability of the mix, they affect the thickness of the layer that can be adopted, they influence the thickness of the individual lift that we are going to compact in the field. Obviously, they are going to affect the stability, stability is mostly provided by the interlocking of these aggregates and not mostly because of bitumen. They contribute to the stiffness of the mix, they contribute significantly to the resistance of the mix to deformation and also they provide or they also influence the fatigue strength of the mix. Fatigue strength is the resistance to failure caused by repeated application of loads or repeated applications of thermal cycles and they also influence the durability of the mixes to some extent. Permeability of course, is a function of the gradation that we select for a given binder content as we vary the gradations, the permeability of the mix is going to be varying and surface texture and frictional resistance also is a function of the maximum size of aggregate that we select and also the size of various fractions. Basically, the gradation that we adopt influences the surface structure and the skid resistance that is going to be available. They also affect the strength, dimensions of various structural elements. This is uh, especially in the case of concrete pavements, so we will not discuss about this here. Coming to aggregate size, this has been briefly discussed uh, earlier in the earlier lessons, but I will quickly go through this. Aggregates of different sizes are normally used in combination, large size will be there, coarse aggregates will be there, fine aggregates will be there, filler will be there. So, different sizes are put together. The maximum size, this is the smallest size of sieve through which 100 percent of the aggregate sample particles pass, but there is another term that we normally use to represent the larger size, nominal maximum size. This is the largest sieve that retains some of the aggregate particles but not more than 10 percent by weight. The minimum thickness of a layer is about 2 to 3 times the maximum aggregate size. So, accordingly depending on the thickness of the layer that we intend to provide, the maximum size of the aggregate can be selected. For example, if you have a gradation given uh, as given in the slide, you have on the left hand side sieve size on the right hand side you have the percentage of aggregates passing through different size by weight. So, you have 19 millimeter size through which 100 percent of the material is passing. So, that is the maximum aggregate size. You have 13.2 millimeter size through which 92 percent is passing. Some material is retained, but which is not more than 10 percent. So, this can be considered as ma nominal maximum aggregate size. Normally, this is how we represent the gradations in a graphical form. The x axis will be sieve size on a log scale, y axis will be percentage passing through the given sieve, which will be on a normal scale. We also discussed in the earlier lesson about referring a, any given gradation that we are using normally is discussed in terms of how it compares with the densest gradation that is possible with the given maximum aggregate size. 
The densest gradation that is possible with a given maximum aggregate size is given by different agencies. We have Fuller and Thomson gradation, where the percentage passing through a given sieve, the percentage will be 100 into small d by capital D to the power 0.5, where small d is the sieve under reference, d capital D is the maximum sieve size. So, accordingly for each successive sieves, what should be the percentage passing through that particular sieve can be calculated. But there is a more practical gradation that is given by FHWA, which is known as 0.45 power gradation, which is applicable for crushed aggregates, which we normally use in payment construction. Here, percentage passing through a particular sieve is given as 100 into small d, which is the sieve under consideration, divided by maximum size to the power 0.45. This diagram shows for a given gradation, what will be the corresponding for, for a given set of sieves, what will be the gradation that would give us maximum or densest gradation as per 0.5 power and also as per 0.45 power. Normally, most of these gradations are represented with reference to a 0 0.5, 0 0.45 chart, which can be constructed in this manner. If we are referring to 13.2 as the maximum size, so on the x axis we take a convenient length and then represent the maximum size at the end that is 13.2. And then if you want to find out where 9.5 sieve size is going to be there on this axis, so we will have to calculate what will be the percentage passing through 9.5 size sieve as per 0.45 law. So, 9.5 divided by the maximum size of aggregate 13.2 to the power 0.45 into 100 that would be 86.2. So, you identify 86.2 on the y axis, y axis is a normal scale, so which would be divided from 0 to 100, identify 86.2 on the y axis and then get the corresponding location of 9.5 on the x axis. Similarly, you could identify the location of 2.36 on the x axis. 2.36 divided by 13.2 to the power 0.45 into 100 that is 46.1. So, start off from 46.1 on the y axis and this is where 2.36 has to be located on the x axis. So, similarly you can locate other sieve sizes on the x axis then this is the chart on which you can plot various gradations. So, typically a dense, dense gradation line is shown for a maximum size of 13.2 with reference to that how various other gradations can look like are shown here. Aggregate gradations can be in terms of the gradation that is selected it can be dense gradation, it can be gap gradation, it can be open gradation, it can be uniform gradation also. So, depending on the layer in which we are going to use these aggregates, depending on the purpose for which this particular mix is used, we can select various gradations. It is not always that we are trying to get the densest gradation. At times, purposefully, we try to deviate from the densest gradation. We try to provide more coarser fractions. In other cases, we try to provide more finer fractions, depending on the requirements, how we have to meet. It is not always the densest gradation that we are interested in. Typically, this is the Ministry of Surface Transport aggregate gradation that is mentioned for bituminous concrete. Similarly, Specifications are available for other types of mixes also as given by MORTH. We have two gradations given here, one has a no maximum nominal size of 19 millimeter, other one has got nominal maximum size of 13 millimeter, which is suitable for 50 to 65 millimeter layer thickness and 30 to 45 millimeter layer thicknesses. What we normally get is, we get aggregates of different sizes. Suppose for a given uh, mix uh, for example, BC, if 13 sieves are specified, we are not going to sieve all the aggregates through each one of the sets and then take those 13 individual fractions and then blend them together. What we would normally get is 2 or 3 or 4 sources from different quarries are in different sizes. Each one of those sizes will have different gradations. We have to blend them together in certain proportion, so as to get the desired aggregate gradation. That is what is known as blending of aggregates. So, each project this is the first exercise one has to be doing. 
So, blending is nothing but finding the proportions in which the aggregates from different sources are to be mixed to attain a gradation that is closer to the target, target gradation. Tar target gradation is what is given by the specification. For example, we have seen what is the gradation given for bituminous concrete by MORTH. The basis for the equation governing the blending process is percentage P of the combined after blending is given as capital A into small a plus capital B into small b plus capital T into small c and so on, where capital A, B, C are the percentage of metal passing a given sieve for the individual aggregates and A, B, C are the proportions that we are taking for these individual sources. We will take up a blending exercise. Uh, there are various methods of blending this including mathematical solutions are available, graphical solutions are available, but it would be nowadays becomes more convenient if you can put all these gradations in an excel sheet and then it will be very convenient because we do not need to get very accurate mathematical solutions because at times we would heuristically adjust certain fractions, we would like to have certain fractions more, certain fractions less. So, if you get accurate solutions by optimizing the blending process and all those things, you may not get a desirable solution. So, what I am trying to do is I am trying to minimize this and then open in excel sheet where we have done some exercise. What we have here is you have the sieve sizes here and we have three different sources of aggregates A, B, C. Those metals have been sieved, the gradation of A is given, percentage passing 19 millimeter, 13.2 and so on is given. Similarly, the gradation of B is given, gradation of C is also given. The target range is also given in column F here. This is the target range and this is the midpoint of the target range and subsequently I also pro provided what are the lower and upper ranges of the target ranges. So, we are trying to combine these things in certain proportion, so that we are going to be getting something closer to the target range. Let me put these values. This is the proportion in which I am going to blend A, B and C. Let me say 10 percent, 30, then balance would be 60 and this is the desired gradation that I am combined gradation that I am getting. If I mix these three sources in this proportion, this, this is what I am getting. Let us compare how this compares with the target gradation 100. 95 is okay between 79 and uh, 100. This is outside the range. This is also outside the range. Outside. This is also outside. Only this is satisfactory. Obviously, this is not a satisfactory solution. So, we can go on trying various combinations of these proportions. I have already done this exercise. So, let me consider. Let me show you. Uh, what what would be better arrangement here? Let me put 24 here, 31 here, and 45 here. Now let, let us examine this gradation: 88, 78, 59, 50, 40. So this more or less satisfies the required gradations. What you see here are the given charts, given gradations for A, B, C and then this is the combined gradation. Let us see how the combined gradation compares with the specifications. These are the upper and lower limits of the specification and the red one is the combined gradation and the blue middle line is the midpoint gradation. In this case, we have attained a gradation by combining these three gradations and three aggregates to get gradation that is very close to the midpoint gradation. It is of course, not necessary that always we, we should be able to get very close to the midpoint gradation. At times, we will be required to go away from the midpoint gradation to satisfy certain requirements. There is another requirement that we have to normally satisfy. We have to check the given gradation that we are selecting for what is known as tender mix. We should not have tender mixes forming because 
these have low resistance to deformation under heavy loads. This occurs very early in the life of payment. The problems that are uh, occurring because of tender mixes, especially the surface will be, uh, it will be abraded when uh, heavy tires, high tire pressures are going to be applied. Main reason for why this uh, happens is, if we are using rounded aggregates, also if we are using high percentage of metal passing 75 micron sieve, also excess of middle sized sand fraction, sand in the sense those aggregates having passing 4.75 millimeter size, if you have too much, uh, too much higher percentage of that, there is a problem of tender mixes forming. How to avoid this is, there is a uh, simple technique that is given. The given gradation join the origin line to 4.75 sieve location. Then with reference to that line, if the given gradation deviates by more than 3 percent at any location, that is known as an hump. So, we should not have humps which are defined by deviation from the line which joins origin to 4.75 millimeter size by more than 3 percent. Okay. This is how we ensure that tender mixes do not form. To summarize, in this lesson we have learnt about the main modes of in which mix, bituminous mixes are going to be failing and we have tried to understand the importance of designing the mixes properly. We also try to identify important parameters to be controlled in mix design. We have uh, under, tried to understand the volumetric analysis of mixes. Also we try to understand the significance of aggregate gradation mix design and we have just seen one blending exercise of aggregates. Let us take up a few questions from this lesson. What are the main modes of failures of bituminous mixes? What is the most important mix parameter and explain its significance? Next, how to draw a FHWA 0.45 chart for 19 millimeter nominal maximum aggregate size? Fourth question, how to check aggregate gradations for possibility of tender mix formation? Next, let, uh, let us take up the answers for questions that we asked in lesson 4.8 which was on bituminous binders. What do you understand by emulsion? Emulsion is a two phase system containing water and bitumen. Bitumen globules are in fine suspension in water. This suspension is made possible by the addition of emulsifier. So, we can use emuls uh, emulsions without heating because they have low viscosity. Next question was, what are the main tests to be conducted on emulsions? The main test that we conducted uh, conduct on emulsion is to ensure that we do not have any separation. So, we conducted test what is known as storage stability test. We also conducted test to find out what is the residue. We test the properties of the residue. The, basically, these are the main tests that we conduct on emulsions. We of course, also find out the viscosity of emulsion. What are the situations that may require use of modified binders? The use of modified binder is required under special situations having heavy loads, lots of uh, uh, load repetitions, excessive climatic, adverse climatic conditions, high temperatures, low temperature and so on, stationary loads. How are modified binders superior to normal binders? Modified binders are normally superior in terms of fatigue performance, more importantly superior in terms of rutting performance. Also they have better temperature susceptibility they are usually better in terms of their resistance to moisture damage. What is the significance of elastic recovery test? Elastic recovery test is to uh, carried out to conduct to find out what is the capability of the material to recover when the material is stretched. It is done by normal uh, ductility test only by stretching the sample, cutting it and then observing how much the binder is capable of recovering. What is the significance of separation test? Because modified binders are usually prepared by adding some modifiers to the binder, which in many cases have the tendency to separate on storage. So, this is a test that is conducted to find out what is the tendency of the modified binder to separate. Thank you.